Okay, I think we can slowly get started. So uh, welcome everyone to this info session on the B Corp movement. My name is Jente and I'm a B Corp coordinator at The Shift. Um, as some of you may know, The Shift and Bila Benelux have created a partnership in October last year. Um, and in, in order to support the movement here in Belgium and um, to really accelerate uh, the movement as well. So we're really happy uh, that you joined here today um, to really deep dive into the B Corp movement, the B Impact Assessment, and also the SDG Action Manager. Before we get started, allow me to give you some housekeeping rules. So please note that this webinar is being recorded. Um, if you have any questions, please post them in the Q&A. Uh, there's a separate box, so not in the chat. Um, and we can answer them all uh, at the end of this session. Um, use the chat for technical issues. So if you experience any problems, um, please use the chat. And uh, presentations and the recording will be shared after the session. So now that we've got the technical stuff out of the way, um, we can introduce the agenda of today. So first of all, um, I will be introducing the B Corp movement to all of you. Um, next up, we have uh, Mattia, who is Business Development Coordinator at Villa Benelux, who will introduce the B Impact Assessment and SDG Action Manager. And then we have a panel, um, normally with three Belgian B Corps, but sadly, uh, Benedict from Technor wasn't able to join um, since she has to do a COVID test this morning. So we will have Eco Birdie and Oxfam Fairtrade. Um, and this panel will be moderated by Sophie de Four, who is um, a challenger at the shift. And as always, we will conclude with a Q&A. So please use the Q&A box as already mentioned. Now, before we deep dive into the B Corp uh, movement, um, this info session is open for uh, non-members of the shift. So uh, I would really like to introduce the shift quickly. So the shift is the organization that I work for. Uh, we're a Belgian nonprofit um, and we call ourselves the Belgian Sustainability Network. So what we do is we try to accelerate a more sustainable world together with our members. Um, so we have different types of members from uh, universities to industry and business, um, actors from government and the public sector and civil society as well. So it's a very broad um, and diverse network um, of around uh, 510 uh, members. And together with them, we really try to um, drive a more sustainable world. Um, and besides our members, we also have some international partners that we work with uh, very closely. So you can see them in the bottom left corner, that's CSR Europe, uh, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and then since October last year, also um, Villa Benelux. Um, now, how do we do this, trying to accelerate a more sustainable world? We do this by identifying four uh, focus areas each year. So for 2021, that was uh, climate, resources, work and inclusion, and reinventing capitalism. And what we do is we try to set up activities, um, workshops, and partnerships um, on those teams, uh, as well as other teams, but with a focus on uh, those four. Um, and each year, these teams uh, change uh, according to what we and our members believe uh, is necessary uh, to take action on in the world. So that was very quickly um, a little info about the shift. Um, and now we can really deep dive into uh, the B Corp movement. So I think we can all agree that uh, over the past year, it, beca it has become even more clear um, that our current economic system is broken. So we really have a problem. We are confronted with some major issues like uh, pollution, social inequality, rising GHG emissions, um, and a lot of natural disasters as well here in Belgium, um, which all of you can probably remember from last summer. Um, so we are confronted with some major issues. If we take a look at some numbers, we can see that 26 people on earth have the same net worth as the bottom 3.8 billion. Um, there's a 60% decrease of wildlife populations across the world. Um, it was in less than 50 years. 
and 12.7 million tons of plastic enter our ocean every year. So it's clear that we have a problem, but how can we solve it? Well, solving this problem requires systems change. And there are two conditions um, for systems change to occur. So the first condition we need is recognizing that the current system is failing. And then the second condition is there needs to be a viable alternative to the current system. So as already mentioned, recognizing that the current system is failing, um, I think we can all agree on this. Uh, ice caps are melting. There's a lot of pollution, as I already mentioned. Um, so this condition uh, is there. And then the second condition is the existence of a viable alternative. Um, and that's really where the B Corp movement and certified B corporations uh, come into play. And so we have the two conditions for systems change, uh, but how do we need to change the system? Well, we need to change our economic system from a shareholder capitalism to stakeholder capitalism. And where shareholder capitalism only benefits the few, is only for the, for the short term, is exclusive and extractive. We want to move to that stakeholder capitalism that is for everyone, for the long term, inclusive and regenerative. So those are really the key words of uh, that new economic system that we want to create. And the B Corp movement is really um, one of the main drivers in uh, driving that change. So the philosophy behind the B Corp movement um, is that business should compete and more importantly collaborate on not just being the best in the world, but the best for the world. Um, so this is really something I want you to remember um, throughout the entire session because it's really the, the red thread of what um, the movement is all about. Um, the B Corp movement originated in the US in 2006. Um, so really out of this idea and this philosophy, and it is powered by the independent nonprofit um, B-Lab. So as you can see, there are uh, B-Labs around the world. Um, it originated in the US, but it really flew over into uh, Europe. Uh, we have some in Latin America as well. Um, so it's really spread out in an international movement. Um, and the idea of B-Lab, so the vision is really to create an inclusive, equitable, a regenerative economic system for all people and the planet. So really that uh, stakeholder economy, that stakeholder um, system that we mentioned before. And um, certifying B corporations is only uh, one step in their theory of change. So BLAP is really a systems change organization. They're not just a certification shop, uh, as to say so. And over the past uh, 15 years, BLAP has try to build tools and programs uh, to really drive changes to behavior, culture, and structural policies um, that are ne necessary to uh, drive that economic uh, systems change. Um, one of the uh, examples of such tools is the B Impact Assessment and the SDG Action Manager, uh, which Mattia will uh, talk to you about some little more after this uh, part of the session. And so, how do you measure success? Um, BLAP um, thinks that it's necessary to measure success in a different way. So we won't measure success anymore by only looking at profits, but success, success is measured by really looking at the positive impact um, that your company has. So positive impact on all stakeholders and not just measuring your profits for your shareholders. And how can we measure this? Um, that's where the B impact assessment comes in. So um, the business impact assessment or in short BIA um, looks at beyond profits and really measures the impacts of a business um, on five uh, key topics. So uh, first of all, uh, employers, then we have environments, the customers of a company, the community, and uh, it also looks at governance. So it is very holistic since it looks at those five topics. Um, so we can really see a, a, a switch um, in the idea of good products, uh, like for example, fair trade for coffee or lead for building or organic for food to now the B Corp certification with 
which certifies the entire company um, and really says, okay, this is a good company and not just a good product that it produces. Um, this is just to give you an idea of uh, the process, um, because I think Natia will also touch upon this in more in depth. Um, but if you want to become a B Corp, uh, a B Corp certified company and you want to join the B Corp movement, uh, the first step you need to undertake is uh, filling out the B Impact Assessment. So it's a free online tool that everyone can use. Um, and it's a great way to see where you already are, the things you're already doing well, and uh, where you need some uh, extra effort. Um, so filling out the B Impact Assessment um, is around 200 questions and you get a score on 200 points. And um, if you have 80 or more points, you can get uh, B Corp certified. Then you come into a review process um, with, B -Lab, with B Lab to really check if all the information you gave in is correct. Um, and then you also have to meet some legal requirements um, and amend your company's constitution to really reflect all stakeholders' objectives. Um, then there are some additional steps, um, signing um, a B Corp declaration, as they call it, in which you say again that you really want to pursue a positive impact on all stakeholders. And um, of course, there's an annual fee involved. But as I mentioned, BLAP is a non-profit, um, so this fee is really to support uh, all the activities of BLAP themselves. Then just to give you an idea of um, the community we have worldwide. So at the moment, we have more than uh, 4,000 B Corps in over uh, 50, uh, 75 countries and 150 plus industries. Um, I think you can yeah, see some of them and really know them. So Ben & Jerry's, for example, so you probably all know IBA, uh, which is a Belgian certified B Corp and then The Guardian, uh, just some names that probably ring a bell. Um, but the idea is really that all of these B Corps, although they're very different, um, have one unifying goal, and that's really to use their business as a force for good to solve some of the most pressing uh, social and uh, natural uh, issues that we, we are facing right now as a society. Um, and here it shows that, um, as I mentioned, the bigger movement uh, was born in the US, but in Europe, um, it's also really booming and growing. Um, you can see that uh, Forbes, for example, is writing articles about B Corp, the Independent is writing articles about B Corp, and there's really a growth in um, interest in the business world. Then just um, some numbers about the Belgian community. Um, as you can see here in Belgium, uh, the B Corp movement uh, wasn't really well known until around 2017. Um, and that's also why we really wanted to create this partnership with Bila Benelux, because we believe that there's a lot of potential here in Belgium. Um, and last year, uh, the movement, or no, better this year, the movement has really known the biggest growth uh, yet. So from 17 certified B corporations in our country in 2020 to 27 certified companies in 2021. And the year is not over yet, so there will probably be a little more before uh, we go to 2022. And this is just to give you an idea of the companies that are in our uh, Belgian community. So we have some big players like uh, Alpro and Danone but we also have uh, some smaller players like uh, Kambuka, for example, which is a sustainable um, drinking and um, yeah, drinking bottle company. Um, so 38 plus B Corps have a presence in Belgium. Um, it's like the Patagonias of the world, for example, but 27 have their HQ in Belgium. And then to see uh, where most of the B Corps are located, so you can get an idea for yourself. Um, you really see that Brussels, of course, um, is a big one uh, with 13 certified B Corps um, that have their HQ in Brussels. Um, and then it's spread uh, more or less equally um, over Flanders and Wallonia. 
So here we have it again, the one unifying goal, um, using business as a force for good to solve some of the most pressing social and environmental challenges. Uh, this is really what I want you to remember uh, of this part of the session. And if you can identify with this goal, um, I would encourage all of you to try to be impact assessment. It's free. Um, it's a great way to measure where you are, where you want to go, and it really offers you a roadmap for improvement. So please, uh, this weekend or maybe on Monday during office hours, um, go to the Being Tech Assessment website. I will put it in the chat as well um, and just try it for yourselves. And then I would like to give the floor to Mattia to uh, explain the B-Impact Assessment and the SDG Action Manager. Tia here. Perfect. Can you share your screen, Mattia? Oh, yes. Hi. Hey, I, yeah, we can hear you. I think you followed the, the link for the attendees, but uh, I just made you a panelist. Oh, that's, that's what it was. I don't <laughs> see the option for sharing my screen. Uh, let me check nor to turn my camera on my apologies no problem maybe it might be best if you follow the other link okay join this panelist Um, can you send me the other link, Yente? Um, yeah, let me check. I think it might be faster if you look uh, on Zoom in your Outlook, Mattia. Yeah. And then you should have gotten it uh, a few days ago. Mm-hmm. On my Zoom, you say? Okay. I'll be right back. Sure, perfect. Maybe in the meantime, um, if you have questions, don't, don't hesitate to ask um, so we can answer them at the end of this session. Let's see, we already have some here. Maybe I can already answer this one. So Demi asks in which other countries than Belgium are B Corp certified companies located? Uh, well, in a lot of different countries. <laughs> um, we have a lot, of, a lot in the US, we have a lot in the Netherlands, uh, but also in Germany, in France. So it's really international, uh, this movement. And I see that Mattia is here right now, perfect. This looks a little bit better. Great. So here we are. Thank you very much for bearing with me. Um, can you see the presentation? Yes. Ah, lovely. Here we are. Thank you very much for bearing with me. Uh, good morning, Belgium. This is Mattia calling from Utrecht this morning. Uh, business development coordinator for Bila Benelux, AKA certification lead, uh, whatever you like is great. Great to be here. Uh, sorry for this little inconvenience. And uh, yes, to what Yente introduced already, first of all, I would like to commend uh, our partnership. We've seen in the graph how things really picked up pace starting from 2017, but from 2019, 2020, when we set up the partnership to uh, celebrating this end of 2021, we really seen a spike in the popularity and in the buzzing of the movement in Belgium. And so uh, I think uh, I think that needs, deserves a mention. So 
this morning I am here, other than to make some trouble uh, with technicalities, to talk you through a couple of our tools. So we have, let's say, two main tools that we provide as BLAB for companies to manage and measure their impact. And I will start with uh, our uh, the tool that is fundamentally instrumental to for companies to meet the performance requirement and eventually achieve the B Corp certification, which is the above mentioned B Impact Assessment or BIA for the sake of brevity. And as uh, the title slide rightfully, um, rightfully states, the BIA is essentially a tool that helps any company really tracking what matters. What does that mean? What is it that matters? Well, uh, Yante walked us through it already quite a little bit. And I think the main, the main goal that the BIA sets for itself and for companies is to redefine uh, success. So what does it mean to be successful as a company? How can a company maximally contribute to provide positive impact to its stakeholders? And when you hear us talking about stakeholder governance, uh, stakeholder benefit from shareholder value to stakeholder value, what we mean is essentially broken down in the five impact areas of the B Impact Assessment. So the B Impact Assessment is, in essence, a very long questionnaire that revolves around five uh, impact areas. And these impact areas represent all the stakeholders that are more or less touched by a company's business operations. So we have workers, environment, customers, community, and governance. So not only the BIA provides uh, a framework to take a snapshot of what's there, but also, and I think this is quite the core characteristic of the BIA is the BIA offers a framework for continuous improvement and for um, companies to craft their own trajectory of, uh, of impact. The BIA is a questionnaire and it's, uh, it's homed on an online platform, which is free and confidential. So any company can create an account uh, free of charge and can play around with it. You can fill it in, you can see how you are doing in each of the impact areas. And uh, again, you can get familiar in tracking your impact. So what's, what, is, what is it that is there? What is that we are doing as a company? But also what is not there and why? And what could we be doing about it? So in the bullet points, uh, the main, um, yeah, the, the main positive, uh, the main positives, the main functionalities of the BIA, which is all encompassing, is quite integrated. Uh, it, it covers as many uh, impact areas as possible in the five that we that we mentioned. There are some benchmarking functionalities so that companies can um, compare themselves to companies that are of a similar size in a similar industry that have filled in uh, at least, let's say, uh, seventy five percent of the BIA. And then uh, what, what my favorite function of the BIA is the improvement. So how companies not only use it as an instrument for certification, but also make it their own and, uh, and use it as a tool for improving. So behind the development of the BIA, there are some standards that are developed at BLAB level uh, across different independent bodies, such as the, the Standards Advisory Council. And uh, the characteristics of the standards that lie behind the BIA and all its questions are essentially the ones that are, that are captured in this slide. So they are comprehensive and positive. So it the, uh, the BIA considers all stakeholders and all aspects of the business, and it focuses on what companies are doing good. So there is no negative, uh, there is no negative uh, score. The worst that a company can do is scoring zero in a question if they are not doing anything about uh, about uh, that specific topic. Um, they are standardized. That there is like quite a balancing act between standardizing and tailoring. So the BIA is as standardized as possible, and uh, but also it is tailored. To the different um, to the different industries and track that uh, a company and sizes that companies might be in, um, the questions are designed to be verifiable 
stakeholder oriented and independently governed and the BIA is in constant development. So every three years, there is a new version of the BIA coming out to account for the latest conversations and the latest, uh, and what, what does leadership mean uh, so that we keep it up to speed uh, to, to the latest conversations and scientific, uh, scientific findings, for example. And then, yeah, the BIA is quite some work to get through, um, but the value of the BIA is basically uh, not only in the certification at the end, but in the, in the journey, in the exercise. And so that's what it is designed to give. Um, I will speed up a little bit with an eye on the time. The BIA uh, focuses on capturing impact accord according to two different points of view. Uh, there are the operations, so the day-to-day -day of the company uh, doing things impactfully. This mm, is, for example, related to questions on whether the facilities are energy efficient, whether you have good employee or transparency policies, these kind of things. And some other sections of the BIA uh, are called impact business models and are designed to capture the very specific ways that the company has to provide value to one of the stakeholders. And impact business models are very specific and are based on a product or a specific beneficiary or the very structure of the company, for example. This is a rough breakdown. Uh, there are the five impact areas with sub areas per each, uh, under each. So these are examples of topics that are, uh, that are asked about in the operational questions. And this is a breakdown of different impact business models. For, so for example, if the company uh, is designed, the product or service is designed to implement principles of circular economy, it is likely that the, that the company would score some points in the resource conservation, IBM, in the environment impact area. Uh, if uh, the company has, uh, is working to alleviate poverty in the value chain, for example, following fair trade principles, probably some points are up for grabs in the community impact area. The disclosure questionnaire is uh, the unscored section of the BIA and is the only, uh, the only section where companies, um, topics that are potentially controversial uh, has to be flagged by the company and is paired with some background check. So uh, the BIA is composed of scored and unscored elements. The scored elements are the operational question and the IBMs. And the unscored section is the disclosure questionnaire that helps BLAB understand whether eligibility uh, considerations should be involved in the certification process or whether the company uh, needs to comply to extra transparency requirements in order to certify. As I said, there are different tracks according to the market, the sector and the size of the company. And these tracks determine the questions that you will see on the BIA. So it's, it's good to get acquainted with those and to pay attention to what tracks you choose. There are all sorts of functional functionalities. You can use the filters, you can set goals, you can, uh, you can have a breakdown of uh, your performance and look at benchmarks. But I think that at this point in time, also, uh, also uh, because I started a couple of minutes late, I would like to direct you to the BIA webinar that I will be hosting next week where I will be uh, diving much more in detail in all these tools and functionalities. Uh, I will post the link in the chat at some point. And uh, with that, I would like to skip to the uh, second tool, which is the SDG Action Manager, which is the tool that we developed in uh, collaboration with the UN Global Compact for uh, business to start contributing actively to the global goals. Um, the SDG Action Manager is a uh, tool that mirrors the uh, BIA and is designed to provide a comprehensive view on how a company can uh, contribute and improve towards meeting sustainable development goals. These are the SDGs. Most of you are familiar with those. Uh, they represent a snapshot of society as we want it. Um, in the couple of years that they've been existing, one of the uh, comments on the stakeholder arena is that uh, SDGs can be quite hard to operationalize, to bring down to the day-to-day -day practice of a company. Uh, we see that there are certification schemes that look at the, uh, at the inside the company, the company level, while the sustainable development goals are very broad and look at society as a whole. So the question was, how can business actively contribute and embed the SDGs in their uh, in their daily practice. Uh, 
yeah. So we launched um, the uh, SDG Action Manager to cater for this need. It is another free online impact management tool to help business take in action towards the SDGs and enable uh, and enabling uh, meaningful action. It was built together after a, a widespread stakeholder consultation to make it as comprehensive and as accurate uh, as possible, of course. The intentions of the SDG Action Manager is for companies to recognize the interconnectedness uh, of the sustainable development goals and avoid cherry picking as much as possible, while at the same time creating focus or those SD of, on those SDGs that are uh, more material for companies, uh, for a certain company rather than another one, for example. And uh, in the SDG Action Manager, quite differently from the BIA, the co companies can also uh, can also understand how their action can hinder or negatively impact each of the SDGs. The SDG Action Manager has some key functionalities. Uh, so the companies get to start out with a baseline module that is based on the 10 principles of the Global Compact. And then the company uh, gets to uh, fill in and obtain scores for each individual module. And again, as a difference from the BIA, on the SDG Action Manager, there is no overall score. As ever, it's a great tool for internal management to try and understand where you stand and what you could be doing better. So goes without saying, answering honestly comes really in your, uh, in your favor uh, and to your advantage. And uh, we have a database of online resources that you can access straight from the platform uh, to better understand questions and improve the internal practice. The risk of negative impact is envisioned in the SDG Action Manager. There, there is a color flag, flag rating. And again, uh, the potential negative impacts of a company's action are taken into account in the SDG Action Manager. And to make things easy, uh, we provide a tracking dashboard. So you can set goals, you can monitor your progress, and in the identify improvement actions, which is really at the core of our practice from only measuring to also uh, using tools to manage uh, the practice of the company. Lastly, the SDG Action Manager and the B Impact Assessment are built on the same platform and they mirror each other. They are linked to each other. Uh, there are some differences. The SDG Action Manager is not instrumental to certification and there is no verification process for that. It's an internal tool to guide departments and also why not to structure your communications around the goals and is organized uh, by module around the SDGs. The impact assessment, we just described it, it is instrumental for BCOR certification. It is meant to be completed. There is an overall score that will be uh, verified and, um, and um, well, yeah, verified. Yes, they have the same question design. Questions on the BIA uh, link to questions on the SDG Action Manager. So to make things easy for you to, uh, to compare and try to understand where you stand and how does that practice that you have in place relate to the SDGs. So you can create your uh, account on the SDG Action Manager on the website itself, or you can link the SDG Action Manager straight from your BIA. And you see uh, indications to do that on your uh, BIA dashboard if you already have an account. I have a snapshot of the certification process, but on account of the time, I think Yente You'll tell me if we need that or if we want to wrap it up here. I think you can go ahead because we have one uh, testimonial less because Benedict can join us. Uh, she has to oh. do a COVID test, so go for oh, it. Oh, yeah, yeah, right, sure. So Yante already uh, walked us through um, the certification process uh, a little bit. I, I will just reinforce a couple, of, uh, a couple of milestones. So this is what the certification process looks like. Uh, and here we are talking standard approach. Uh, the standard approach for certification is the approach that most companies follow that are not as um, complex in their structure. So for companies that operate uh, within like limited geographies, so not many, um, not many markets, and there are, uh, yeah, well, in making this more complex than it needs to be. So for less complex companies, 
uh, we have the standard approach, while for larger companies that are active in, in many geographies, we have the large enterprise approach, which is a bit of a different beast that I will be not be covering today. So this is the overall, uh, what most companies follow, which is completing the BIA, reaching a minimum of 80 points uh, to be eligible for a certification. Once the company, and only once the company reaches the 80 point bar, uh, it can can it physically submit for review? So you will not see the button submit unless you score at least 80 points. First of all, there is an evaluation. Well, first there is an evaluation queue uh, where a company waits for capacity to be allocated and uh, where companies can still work on a couple of uh, on a couple of aspects in the BIA. The BIA remains editable up until the evaluation starts after which it locks and it starts to be verified. So after the evaluation queue, there is an evaluation where an analyst gets in touch with you and make sure that all the basic information that was filled in within the BIA is accurate. So for example, whether the company belongs to the right sector, whether the company has indicated the right size according to the full-time equivalency, uh, of, uh, of the employees. And also a preliminary scoring screen uh, is performed. So for example, the company is scoring some points in impact business models. So probably you will be asked a couple of questions to understand, to double check whether the IBMs are uh, indeed applicable. Um, after the evaluation, there is a verification queue where the company gets some tasks to complete some documentation to upload. And again, capacity is allocated. And then the verification. The verification is the step where that most companies imagine uh, when thinking about the B Corp review process. And that's the moment where an analyst is assigned and it's like, right, the company is scoring this many points in these impact areas. You are saying in this question that you have that specific policy in place. Let's see. Do you have documents to support that? So that's the verification and it's the last stage. If after the verification, the score is still above 80, the company gets to certify as a B Corp. If, uh, if uh, unfortunately it is the case that the company falls below 80, it gets a window of three months uh, to try to implement uh, short term improvements or low hanging fruits to get back to 80. If the company makes it, congratulations. If it doesn't, the review is closed and the company gets to uh, work on some improvements and submit again. Uh, as Yente mentioned, uh, upon certification, the company pays the uh, yearly certification invoice for a, for a certification cycle of three years. And it signs the declaration of interdependence and the B Corp agreement to uh, formalize the certification. After three years, if the company is willing to do so, if the company has found value in the certification and in, in the activities that Bila provides for the community, then it can, um, can choose uh, to recertify following a similar process. This is another visualization of the same process. Uh, and I think what's uh, relevant to, uh, to point out is that as per April, 2021, for every company that uh, submits the BIA, uh, BLAB introduced a, a submission fee for companies to provide a proof of commitment to the certification process. And this is a one-time non-refundable fee of 250 euros. Well, BIA, B Impact Assessment, SDG Action Manager, overview of certification process, that be it? Perfect, thank you so much, Mathieu. I think it was uh, very clear. And as Mattia also mentioned, uh, next week there's really a deep dive into the impact assessment. So for everyone who wants to get started, I put the um, link to register in the chat. Um, so please do. Um, and then we can move on to the panel. So just really quickly, uh, as I already mentioned, this panel will be moderated by Sophie, who is one of our um, challengers, uh, the previous change makers that some of you may know. Um, and the panel will be with Joris van Briel, who is co-founder of EcoBirdy, and Tom Feyacht, who is sustainability coordinator at Oxfam Fairtrade. So sadly, Benedict couldn't join, um, but Sophie, the floor is yours. 
Thanks a lot, Jensa. Uh, so Jensa and Mattia already set out uh, what a theory looks like for becoming a B Corp, uh, but obviously it's always nice to hear uh, what it looks like in practice. Um, so I'm very happy that Tom and Joris are with us today uh, and they will tell us a little bit uh, about their journey on how to become a B Corp uh, and how they're experiencing it in practice. Uh, but maybe not everyone uh, knows EcoBirdy and, and, and Oxfam Fairtrade. Um, so Joris, could you uh, kick us off by telling us a little bit about yourself and uh, what EcoBirdy does? Yes, thank you. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, yeah, I'm J Joris van Wiel. I'm the co-founder and the designer of uh, EcoBirdy. Uh, we are um, a, a Belgian uh, brand based in Antwerp, and we create uh, furniture for kids and uh, grown-ups using repurposed plastic from discarded toys and household materials. Um, yeah, like our chair you can see behind me. Um, we were launched in uh, 2018 and um, yeah, we, we launched our brand after two years of preparation and research on how we can uh, recycle uh, discarded plastic toys in a sustainable way. Uh, from the beginning, actually our design and also our processes are, were already based on uh, social and environmental performance. So before Entering into the B Corp community, we set these values already as uh, important. Um, that, that's also why we apply an environmentally friendly production process, meaning um, responsible sourcing and uh, recycling. Because, like uh, Yante uh, showed in her introduction, uh, 12.7 million tons of plastic end up in the ocean. And that's something our company is uh, trying to fight, fight the plastic pollution. We work as much as possible with uh, local stakeholders. Um, yeah, why? Because we think it's, uh, it makes sense as a, as a company of today and you can uh, inspire people around you and, uh, and you can build like uh, strong uh, relationships and even friendships and uh, we also engage our customers. Customers are very important for a company to continue because uh, yeah, they're paying the bills and um, we try to engage them in our communication. And also in, in our, um, yeah, we join ex exhibitions and installations and, uh, and there we try to um, visualize um, yeah, problems like the climate change into an uh, artistic, um, installation and that, that makes part of our communication. Um, we, we also active in the community, I would say, like we involve with the local suppliers. We work with a sheltered workshop in uh, Maxim that's close to Antwerp. And we also um, organize a school program, not always easy in times of COVID, but uh, we are still positive on that to inspire children and uh, and their parents on the plastic pollution and uh, show them our, our example of recycling. Um, our team, we are, we are a small company. We are um, just four people, two co-founders co and two fixed employees with a permanent contract. Um, we joined B Corp in 2019 as the 10th company in Belgium. And um, yeah, up to today, today we had a wonderful collaboration with a fellow uh, Belgian B Corp, Mustela, where we uh, they came to us. They had a, um, yeah, it's a brand. I don't know if you know from the baby uh, um, care products, shampoos for for babies and children, and they uh, we collected their uh, empty plastic uh, packaging through pharmacies. Then they were recycled in our with our partner from the sheltered workshop, and we made um, a, a special edition of lamps and kitsch chairs for Mustela, which they, they were donated to um, partners of Mustela. Uh, they went to charity. That's that's briefly what is uh, EcoBirdy about. Thanks a lot, Joris. And um, can I ask, why did you um, decide to become a B Corp corporation? Because, I mean, Jens and, and, and Mattia already mentioned there's this, this, this big process. It's 200 questions that you have to fill in. So why, as a small company, did you still take the effort to, to do that, to go through that process? Yeah, indeed, we, we, have, we have like uh, 
1,000 jobs to do in a day if you're a small company in the startup phase, especially in 2019. But we were tipped by another B Corp uh, to, because we, we, we told them all about our social and environmental values. And they said, you should join the B Corp because it makes sense to profile yourself on an international level. So it was obvious for us to join. Thanks, Joris. Uh, Tom, could you also briefly introduce yourself and um, Oxfam Fairtrade and maybe also tell us why, uh, I mean, I guess Oxfam is already associated uh, in, in people's minds with sustainability um, and, and, and caring for workers. So why did you still feel that the B Corps uh, certification would have added value for you? Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Um... Thank you, Yinte, Sophie, uh, for giving us the opportunity uh, to share our experience uh, with you. Uh, I'm Tom Feyerts. I'm uh, the quality engineer and prevention advisor at Oxfam Fairtrade. And uh, I also was responsible uh, to coordinate uh, the B Corp certification for Oxfam Fairtrade. So Oxfam Fairtrade is a Belgian uh, cooperative, uh, part of Oxfam Belgium. Uh, we work with uh, 40 people, more or less, at the moment. And uh, we yeah, buy, import, and distribute fair trade food products. Uh, we're based in Belgium, in Ghent. And as an organization, a fair trade organization, uh, we celebrated our 50th birthday uh, this year. So uh, we have some time already that we exist. Uh, bon, we work with uh, very different products uh, like chocolate, coffee, of course, but also uh, wine, spirits, uh, snack bars, olive oil, rice. So very different supply chains uh, with very different partners. Uh, we buy uh, finished products from producers in the South. Uh, that's what we're most uh, known from. Uh, but we also uh, supply uh, raw materials uh, to processors uh, in Europe uh, to make uh, snack bars or uh, to toast uh, our coffee, for example. And some products uh, we buy as a finished product from other fair trade organizations uh, in Europe. We also have very different uh, clients. Um, we sell our products in uh, supermarkets. We do exports uh, in Europe and uh, to countries like uh, Korea, Hong Kong, Japan. Um, so uh, in total, I think we work with more or less a uh, hundred different uh, suppliers. Um, and our biggest client, of course, um, is on, are the, the world shops uh, that are uh, managed by the volunteers of uh, Oxfam uh, World Winkles. And that brings us maybe to your second question, because uh, most people know uh, Oxfam World Winkles from the volunteers and the shops uh, in Belgium. And they know Oxfam Solidaritat, maybe, from the projects they do in the South. But uh, Oxfam Fairtrade is, is less known. Uh, maybe it's because the NGO part of Oxfam is very visible. Uh, they have projects, uh, they have the world shops, they have uh, well, a mission, vision, strategic plans. They communicate very well. And Oxfam Fairtrade was was, not anymore, but was more uh, an operational unit uh, that does a lot of practical things, but uh, without much visibility or structured monitoring. So, and that was the, the biggest reason why we applied for the B Corp certification, because that gave us an opportunity um, to put everything together uh, that we already did in the different uh, departments of the BIA assessments and really um, make a benchmark of how we uh, as a company uh, behave uh, in uh, comparison with other organizations. 
Um, and we did that uh, in the end of 2019 uh, to make our strategic plan, our first strategic plan on sustainability where we structured everything and we used then the B Corp assessment as the means to get everything structured. Thanks, Tom. And um, did you immediately um, apply for certification or did you really use uh, the BIA as a tool to also find out where you still needed to improve? Uh, and, and maybe what was the biggest challenge in um, getting to those, those 80 points? Uh, well, we decided to use the tool, the BIA, uh, end of 2019, we filled it in for the first time as a benchmark. But in the process, uh, well, some people participated in sessions like this one. Uh, others went to the B Corp Summit in uh, the Netherlands in 2019. Um, and in this process, we decided that uh, B Corp, B Corp certification and improving on B Corp uh, assessment and score uh, was, was a very good way to get things structured and also to to have all our colleagues uh, behind an ambitious uh, sustainability plan uh, and to communicate internally and externally. So really the certification and um, the improvement of our score became a centerpiece in our sustainability plan. And okay, end 2019, we filled in uh, this, the BIA for the first time. Uh, we applied for revision and verification end of 2020, so one year later, and uh, we were B Corp certified in June this year uh, with uh, 123 points. So that's uh, our Matthew journey in a nutshell. Great, uh, Joris. Does that does that relate to you? Um, was it the same the same kind of process for you that you first filled in uh, the the questionnaire and then improved on on some aspects? Yeah, well, what we found actually the greatest challenge is to make uh, everything measurable because uh, to many questions they are um, yeah, they ask to prove with numbers and uh, you can you can show good intentions, uh, but. Uh, you also need to gather all the information and turn them into uh, accessible content. Meaning, uh, like for example, on, on product level, you need to make a um, life cycle assessment to see if, if your product performs well on, uh, on, on these values. And, and it can go very detailed, but it makes also uh, rethink about your processes and uh, products. And, uh, and in a way it make, makes, makes you smarter and also makes the product smarter. So I think it's, even if you don't reach the level of the certification, I think it's, it's worth to, to do it. I think there is a, a lot of people in the audience who might also want to become a B Corp. Um, what would you, you say to them, Tom, um, in terms of what did you learn from the process or what kind of tips and tricks could you give to them um, when they start the process? Um, but the first tip maybe that I can give from our experience is you have to be ambitious from, uh, from the beginning when you start the process. First of all, because it's necessary to be ambitious for the planet, but also because when you do all the efforts, you have the baseline uh, data, you have the ambitious targets. This makes the process of collaboration and communication internally, externally with other stakeholders much more easier and much more clear. When we began, uh, I thought some ambitions like, uh, for example, uh, selling only organic products, we now have a 50-50 mix, would be a very hard uh, nut to crack for especially our sales department. But over the years, things went easier and were more clear and now there's really no internal discussion that uh, we will have only organic products so you have to be ambitious from the beginning and then the process is clear for everybody and you can uh, unite behind uh, the same uh, aims and targets so that's the first one and the second one connected to that 
also is to begin uh, communicating very early internally about B Corp, B Corp certification, sustainability uh, in the broader sense. Because after the certification, uh, other departments like communication, marketing, sales uh, must be ready or should be ready to explore the advantages of uh, B Corp certification and all the work and data gathering on, uh, on sustainability. Because, of course, the certification, like others already said, isn't an end point. It's only a means to an end to begin improving, to begin communicating, and, and so on. So those are uh, a few tips. Great, Tom. Uh, and, and if you say communicate about it early um, to, to all your employees, um, does that then mean that there were a lot of people involved in, in the process? Or was it mainly a small team who did the assessment uh, and then you worked on um, yeah, making sure that everyone was on board? The assessment was a smaller team internally to put together all the data. We did a few uh, sessions uh, with all employees to explain what's B Corp and what's... But in our experience, uh, we didn't prepare well enough to for the communication and how to use the B Corp certification after the certification process. The certification process is very clear. Right? It's already explained uh, here in the session. But then afterwards, you're certified. And uh, OK, and in our case, we were certified in June. And everybody goes on holidays. And you come back and OK, we're a certified B Corp. And uh, I think this year, we didn't uh, manage to get enough out of the certification because it wasn't the certification was included in the year plans, but what afterwards is in the year plans for uh, 2022. So next year we will uh, pick more fruits from our certification than, uh, than we did until now. And our communication will be better than, uh, than, than until now about our B Corp and sustainability. We're working uh, as, a, for an, as an example on our first sustainability report uh, as Oxfam Fairtrade. We didn't do this before, but now with all the data we, we have structured, uh, beginning or in April next year, we will have our first uh, yeah, sustainability report as, as Oxfam Fairtrade, and we will have a lot of communication about that and, and so on. So. Thanks, Tom. I think that's a, that's a great tip for, uh, for the people in the audience. Uh, by the way, if you have any questions, do uh, use the Q&A uh, uh, at the bottom of your screen, um, because we'll move to, to Q&A session uh, in a bit, um, so we can also answer your questions. Uh, but before we move to the, to the Q&A, uh, Joris, could you also share from your side what you think uh, good tips would be for people who want to get started with the process? Uh, yeah, I think keeping a record of data, that is, the, as Tom mentioned, is very uh, important for the assessment. Create a, a system that works for your company, like we, we work with physical products, uh, not so much services. So then create a, you know, like the environmental management system, which is required that, that fits with your company and, um, and see where, on which point your company can bring uh, yeah, social and environmental value. And, uh, and, and you can really work on that. You can, there are tools, for example, you can contact, uh, for, in, in, for example, in our sector, OVA, more Vito, to, for external advice and improve your, um, your products and systems. And that will make that you also have a, a higher score and better chance for the, for the assessment. Because it's it's challenging and um, and you need to be very uh, transparent on your numbers, which is correct. And um, um, I think for in in the communication um, in Belgium, B uh, Corp is, is not not so known yet, especially two years ago. I remember we had a we had an interview with a with a newspaper about about our products, which was great. And the journalist she wrote about C Corp. So, but, but you have to explain uh, all the time, what is B Corp, what are the values about it, but it's good. And then all people, they, they, they pick it up and, and you see that uh, it really inspires also other companies. And I'm, uh, I'm sure that, that, that uh, com uh, companies, they learn about B Corp through EcoBerry and, and they apply it and, and that reaches also good. 
another thing is you need to be aware like with i think with all kind of uh, certifications and um, and patents that you will be approached by companies that uh, that see you as a peacock and try to sell their services be, so be also aware of that but i think that is um, all manageable um yeah but i think the the, the biggest an advantage to be a B Corp is that you can uh, prove that your that your uh, that your good intentions are checked by an external neutral party and and um, and to potential clients and and even suppliers that can be helpful. I think that is uh, that are the main advantages. Thanks a lot, Joris. Um, I, I think maybe community uh, can be can be something that's that's less tangible for people in in the in the B Corp process. I mean, we talk a lot about environment, about workers, uh, and and I heard you mention before that you're doing this this school project. Could you tell us a little bit about that and maybe some other things that you do for uh, for the community part? Yeah, the school program actually that was from the beginning when we. When we started with this project, we, we went to schools to explain about a plastic problem and also uh, um, yeah, collect first. To, it was to gather also information if our if our business concept could work and it, but and there was uh, interest from it and so we continued it. Um, and, but I think also working with uh, with the local uh, suppliers, I th I think that's also part of the community because it's mostly like. Uh, can be like giving even small jobs may uh, creates this um, yeah this this uh, collaboration stronger because we need we work in a, in a competitive world like if you you have like in, in the furniture sector a lot of furniture is produced in uh, low labor cost countries and uh, and based on an, on an old, on a very different business model and that we need to be um, Realistic, but I think B Corp gives a, gives a certain confidence in that, and uh, to continue in in uh, in uh, in working in in a in a in a good way, let's say. Thanks, Joyce. Uh, Tom, could you maybe also give us an example of um, something either you did on community or other examples of of, of a process you set up with stakeholders? Um... Uh, yes. Um... As Oxfam Fairtrade, we work together uh, more with uh, the partners in the South uh, for uh, importing, buying products. The, the community in the North, uh, it's Oxfam Wereldwinkels, which manages the world shops and the volunteers. Uh, they do the school projects, uh, the, the North projects, like we call them. Uh, Oxfam Fairtrade uh, works more with uh, the producers we buy from. And in that case, uh, well, we have 50 years working as a fair trade organization. So on the social part, uh, with the fair trade premium, fair trade projects, and the fair trade certification, uh, we were already complying and ahead of uh, sector. Uh, but uh, where we lagged behind, in my opinion, was on the environmental climate change uh, part. Uh, so in our new sustainability plan, um, our ambition is also to reach uh, net zero in 2025. So that means reducing emissions uh, with our suppliers and processors in the north. So we work together with processors that are ambitious in their uh, climate targets. Um, but we also uh, are beginning to work with our producers in the south on uh, pro projects of uh, reforestation, uh, protecting climate, um, working on uh, life cycle analysis to reduce in certain aspects uh, emissions in the South. So we are uh, funding now projects uh, with our sales. Uh, We're funding projects with our partners uh, to to reduce emissions, uh, to inset uh, emissions, and to reach uh, net zero in uh, 2025. So that's a, a newer or a new aspect in our ways of working to map emissions and to reach net zero in all our supply chains for all our products in 2025. 
Brilliant. Thanks, Tom. Um, I'll, I'll move to some questions from, um, from the chat now. Um, so I have a question here um, about the certification process after three years. Uh, do you need to improve your score or to demonstrate that you put in place improvements? I don't know if there's anyone from our panel who wants to take that question. I can uh, go ahead. Great, thanks. <laughs> So uh, no, you don't have to improve your score. Um, as long as you get 80 points or more, you can still recertify. Uh, but what we do see is that most companies who recertify really do improve their score. Um, and that is because the B Impact Assessment really offers um, guidelines to improve on uh, the different aspects. So it's really easy to put um, certain things in place that you didn't have before in those three years before recertifying. So almost all companies that recertify have a higher score than uh, initially they had. Sorry, I un didn't unmute myself. <laughs> Thanks, Jente, very, very clear. Uh, another question in our chat is from um, Elisa, who's uh, asking if the process is different for uh, a new company. How long does your company have to have been operating uh, to be able to certify? Um, I can also take this one. I think Mattia also answered it um, because Diana also asked the same question. So if you really want to become B Corp certified, um, you need to be operating for at least one fiscal year because you need to fill in the B Impact Assessment with uh, all the information of the previous year. But if you've been uh, in operations for uh, at least a month, you can also apply for pending B Corp status. So if you're a startup and you haven't been uh, operating for a year, you can apply for uh, the specific status. Um, and the idea of a pending B Corp status is that you also go through the B Impact Assessment, but you fill it in uh, with your best guesses for each answer. And then after a year, um, you need to fill it in again with the correct information. And if you then reach the 80 plus points, you can become B Corp certified. So Mattia also put a link to the pending B Corp status um, in the answer box, which you can take a look at. Thanks, Jente. Uh, then there's a question from uh, Pauline to um, Joris, but maybe Tom also has an answer. Um, whether there are any external organizations um, that can help you to get a higher score? And I think Joris, Pauline is, uh, is, is referring to you mentioning OVAM, I think, uh, in your explanation. Uh, yes, it's, it's to uh, um, motivate your, your data. You can um, yeah, ask external companies to value your processes and products. So it's actually to, um, yeah, to find uh, expertise. Uh, Tom, did you work uh, with any external organizations? Um, we work a lot with external organizations. Now, uh, to, for the data part, we've, we did that, that ourselves, except for the expertise on life cycle analysis. We work together uh, with uh, OVS here in, here in Ghent, an organization. Also for packaging improvement, uh, we work uh, together uh, with OVS and Pack for Food and, and others. And yeah, networking within the B Corp uh, community uh, also helps a lot uh, to, for cooperation on sustainability, on packaging, to keep up with trends and everything. So. That helps also. Thanks, Tom. Um, then there's a question from uh, Demi, who's asking whether it's more convenient for um, consumer good organizations than for service companies to become uh, B Corp. Um, I don't know, Jens, maybe that's that's one for you in, in, in the membership. What kind of organizations do you have? Yeah, so um, indeed, we have a lot of consumer good organizations, um, but not alone. So it's not that it's easier for them. I think it's just a lot more consumer good organizations who are looking for something like a B Corp certification. Um, but there are also some service companies uh, in the community here in Belgium. We have, for example, CO2 Logic, um, and we have public, uh, Sustainable Public Affairs, which is a, a public affairs company. So um, it's also possible and uh, not harder for service companies to become B Corp certified. Thank you, Jente. Um, Tom, and, 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 and yours, another question to you. Um, what do you feel is the, is the biggest advantage now that you are a B Corp uh, certified company? Uh, maybe Tom first? Okay. 
um, yeah, the biggest advantage from the certification point of view is really, uh, like you already said already also, if your data ordered uh, and being forced to map things out uh, and uh, report and communicate internally, externally. Um, and then once you're certified, uh, the biggest advantages uh, are yeah, being part of the B Corp uh, network for learning, keeping up with trends, cooperation, etc. And uh, from a sales point of view, uh, the possibilities for us, uh, for uh, yeah, new customers for our products or our co commodities, co-branding with other B Corps is something we're thinking about. And of course, Oxfam as a distribution channel for other B Corps. Um, at the moment, you know, we're only distributing products from Fairtrade Original, which is another B Corp from uh, the Netherlands, but when there are possibilities. So that's from our point of view. And, and, and for, some yours? Yes. Go ahead, sorry. Yeah, B Corp for, for EcoBerry is actually a, a useful uh, guideline and also helps us in, uh, in, in decision making. Like if we need to uh, decide about a new product, then we have the values of B Corp in mind. And it, um, yeah, it brings also um, a structure in, in our social and environmental ambitions, which we can clearly subdivide in the five topics of B Corp, like uh, governments. It's like you define your mission and ethics and um, uh, if you hire a worker you uh, you give financial security and a fixed contract for example rather than working with freelancers and um, yeah hire from minority groups um, community um, sourcing from local suppliers and uh, in our case we, we work with uh, schools organize a school program environmental um, yeah, develop your uh, environmental management system and work on the responsible sourcing and also um, yeah, work on the innovation of, of um, how you can reduce waste. And that can be in all that kind of levels. I think in every company, there's a way you can reduce waste. And on the yeah, customers, the communication with customers, involve them in your uh, in your in your uh, in, in your work and in uh, and what, what, why you uh, make a product locally or why is it um, um, inclusive like everybody can use your, this this product and um, yeah and then further it's like you have an uh, um, with, with with most certifications you're being actually audited by an external party and that proves to uh, to potential partners that you um, that you're reliable in a way. I think that are the biggest advantages of being a, a B Corp. Wonderful, thanks, Joyce. Um, I have one last question for, for you, um, Joyce, which is from Sonia from um, Danona. Um, and she's asking whether you have your own recycling installation for plastic um, or does it go via Fos Plus? No, we have, we have partially our own uh, recycling um, in, in with with our partner in the, of the uh, of the sheltered workshop, and um, but we also work with with uh, a partner in the industry for the for the big amounts. Great, thanks a lot, Joyce. Um, I think we've we've answered um, all the questions from from the audience. Um, so Jens, I don't know if you have any more questions for our panelists or whether we um, uh, wrap it up. Oh, perfect. I think we can uh, wrap it up. Thank you everyone for joining and thanks to the speakers, of course, for sharing your knowledge. I think it was very insightful. Um, and I would just like to say to everyone, if you have more questions, please reach out 